Robert, how you doing, man? Good, man. How about yourself? <laughs> I'm doing good. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. I've uh, been trying to trying to get with you for a while, and you're a busy guy. Well, honored to be here. I love watching the show. Thank you. Thank you. So let's get man right on right into it. What uh you seem you seem to shoot everything. What what's what's your uh <laughs> what's your cup of tea? How did you get into this whole mess? Man, uh uh I'm the whole coffee shop, I guess, not a cup of tea. Uh, <laughs> I like anything to do with precision rifle. Uh if it has anything to to do with a long distance precision, anything like that, I'm all about it. So I do PRS, NRL Hunter, ELR, shoot a little bench dress, things like that. Uh, and I learn from every discipline and I might take something I learned from one and apply it to the other, uh, you know, or so. So I don't do any pistol, shotgun, any of the, that kind of stuff, but anything with precision rifle, I've, I've got a genuine interest in it and, and all about learning. How did, how did that come about? Since I was a little kid, I've been, obsessed with uh long range shooting or just i didn't have an avenue to do it but i knew i wanted to do it my family was big shotgun hunters rabbits squirrel coon stuff like that so everything they did was a shotgun and there was an old 6555 swedish in the cabinet that uh no one ever shot ever and i just was always drawn to that and i wanted to do that and that's that's for sport that's that's no good you know yeah uh it, i'm from louisiana it's really thick so shotgun kind of made sense i just had to rebel <laughs> and I just went, I just wanted rifle from the get go. So when I got my first decent job, that's the first thing I bought was a precision. What I thought at the time was a precision rifle and it just lit a fire and it, and it grew. I went to a match. I hit one target, uh, the entire match. I hit one target and it was the first shot of the day too. <laughs> so I thought like, this is, I'm golden. <laughs> I got this. I didn't hit another target, but I left there with a, a fire and I said, I'm never going to do that again. And it's been, and I still, I don't, I don't feel like I'm, uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, getting burned out. Every match feels just as fun as the the first one. So I, I love it. What, what did you buy? I still got it in the safe. It's, uh, it's a very interesting one. It's a Winchester model 70 long range hunter with the boss tuner on it. So, uh, <laughs> and what made it crazy. And the reason I only hit one target I learned is this before ballistic calculators and stuff like that. It has, I can't remember if it's, uh, it's an MOA, but it, it's either uh, eighth minute internals and a quarter minute turret or quarter minute turret and an eighth minute adjustment. So the turret that you rotate doesn't match what it's doing on the inside. <laughs> uh, and you can tear apart that owner's manual. It's a Pentax light seeker and there, it, nowhere does it say where the reticle is calibrated. None of that. So, wow. And, uh, I showed up with some core lock 300 wind mag ammo. <laughs> thought I was doing something. <laughs> hey, it doesn't matter. The, the, what matters is that you got started. That's it. And I'd plan on one day shooting another match with that gun just to see what I could do with it today, you know, as opposed to my first match. So. <sighs> You just gave me an idea because the first time I shot a F class match was with a 300 win mag, and I sold it, but I know where it's at. So I might reach out to the to the current owner and see if he still has it, and you know maybe I'll go shoot an F class match with it. That would That'd be interesting. I'll come shoot with you. <laughs> that would be interesting. So so you shoot you shoot this match, you hit one target, the first one, which had to feel good because like you said, you're like, here we here we go, and then it was like, Psh. so yeah. so. What happened after that? Like what, you know, what goes on after that? Go. All right. So the main thing that that match did was I got instantly exposed to a lot of new gear because this was before the internet was big and you could get on these groups and, and learn stuff by the internet. I mean, the internet existed, don't get me wrong, but nothing like it is today. This is, you know, I think I got into it kind of 06 was my initial uh, uh, introduction into it in 07, 08. I'm kind of getting a little bit deeper into it, but you know, I'm seeing things. I've never saw a, uh, a, a scope without a, a cap turret. Uh, didn't know anything about first focal plane or these match bullets. So uh, instantly I'm exposed to things that were completely off my radar and exposed to people that knew how to use it. Uh, and that was the main thing. So man, it was fate that I went to, I was traveling three places 
and all three of these places, I meet a guy that is pretty good with precision rifle. One was a bench rest F class guy. One was a bench rest tactical guy. And one was a straight up tactical guru. So I had some mentors that kind of took me under the wing. I'm sure I pestered them way too much, but they knew I was hungry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just sought out knowledge from all of them. And uh, it was just nowhere to go but up after that because I'm on the very bottom. Uh, so, you know, I'm getting exposed to things. And, and also, I'm not in an echo chamber of one guy's head. I'm learning from different things because the bench rest guy is way different than the tack guy, you know. And uh, it just was a great learning opportunity. And I was exposed to that for a year or two. And then I had to move on. But I had a, a base of knowledge that I couldn't have asked for for any other you know, incredibly lucky to get and still count my lucky stars. I, I got that. The, the Bantress guys and the PRS guys, they're, they're probably as far apart as they anybody can be in the precision world. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, that had to be challenging to to listen to. Because you, you, you want to you listen to them, right? But they're very far apart. <laughs> <laughs> they are. And you have to take things that will work in one and some things will not work. There's no crossover on some applications, say like certain optics and stuff. But when it comes to reloading practices and bullets uh, and stuff like that, then and pure accuracy. Well, the bench rest guys got that figured out. And this was before the PRS existed. So these matches were more like what they called sniper matches and field matches. You know, there, there was a lot more running involved and stuff like that. But the targets at this time were a lot bigger. Because I, no one had a Kestrel. No one had anything that uh, could really fine-tune your data. I had one drop chart that I used year-round. And when it was really <laughs> hot, I'd hold a little low. And when it was cold, I'd hold a little high. Like, <laughs> Hey, <it> was, <laughs> that, that's interesting. Remember they used to sell, uh, I think they still do, but I remember they, they used to sell like uh, uh, laser-edge scope caps that you could send in your drop data yep. and the, it, and people would buy it. Like I, I didn't, I was too broke to buy one. So I made my own. I, I just put tape around it. And yep. I, I, but, uh, that was my drop chart. And, you know, I'd set it up here in Texas and then I go hunting in Colorado. Right. Luckily I never had to shoot anything, <laughs> you know, with that kind of knowledge. But yeah, I remember that now that you say that just, just one for all one size fits all. <laughs> yeah. We're so spoiled these days. You can, you, I see guys getting in the PRS and they're they're griping because their data's a, a tenth off at a thousand yards. I'm like, dude, I I would have <laughs> prayed to be within a meal at a thousand yards when I first started. <laughs> uh, the chronographs, we all went to this one guy's house and shot across his chronograph. He would write down and it, it was an older old 35p and it gave the like the receipt looking yeah, the receipt. scanner. And we would take that to his house and he would put it in, uh, it was Sierra X-Ball, a PC program. And I still have that in my <laughs> uh, reloading room to this day because I do not want to forget where I came from. And it was crazy close for the numbers you would get, you know, but, you know, you didn't just have your own lab radar or magneto speed or Kestrel, you know, those, unless you were rich uh, or something. Well, they you know, didn't just, exist. They didn't exist. You couldn't even have it, you know, even yeah. it didn't matter how much money you had. They didn't exist. <laughs> the 35 P I just, I just gave mine away uh, to one of my guys. <laughs> I had, you know, I had a 35 P right. Um, and I just gave it away a couple of months ago because uh, I had it here. And he was asking about chronographs. I'm like, do you want to buy one? Or do you just want to have one? He goes, I just want to have one. I said, you can have this one. This is a really good one. It's kind of, by today's standard. It's kind of bulky and everything. I said, but it works. And I gave it to yes. him and oh man, he's happy. He's, he's, he, he brings me, the, he sends me screenshots of his little receipts, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so cool, man. It's so cool. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm very fortunate that I came from those days and struggled. And there's people that were in it way before I was. So I can't say like I was a pioneer or anything like that, but I learned from some of who I consider the pioneers of it. Those are the guys I followed and really looked up uh, to. <clears throat> they didn't know me, but I know who they were. And I just studied everything from them. And, and what I learned from that is it taught you problem solving because you actually had problems. You had to solve them and, you know, and nowadays you can almost, it sounds bad. I'm all in favor for it, but you can almost buy your way to perfect stuff right off the bat these days. You can get amazing barrels, bullets, powdered dispensers and scales, and then chronographs and uh, ballistic solvers. I mean, you know, you can get so close these days 
uh, and just due to the technology and I'm all about it. I love it, but I still like rem reminiscing. <laughs> well, the other thing about nowadays is you can just copy somebody else's, you know, like somebody can yeah. ask you, Hey Robert, what are you shooting? And you just yep. say, this is the rifle. This is the action, the barrel, the cartridge, whatever. And all they have to do is copy it and they're going to be very successful. Like, you know, they're going to be yep. almost there, right? It's, they're still going to require that they put in their work. But back then, it seemed like nobody had it figured out. How much, you know, they kept changing bullets, cartridges. Uh, I mean, to, even today, people change, but not like we used to back then, right? Yeah. And, and you know, everyone chases the new shiny today for sure. If, if some guy wins, everyone wants to start getting their components because that must be why he's winning. It has... It cannot be the skill. There's nothing about him that no, can do it. So, no. you know, every, but back then, you know, the winners were much more prominent. Like it was narrowed down to, the, to a fewer class of people, I'd say. Uh, and, you know, so people really influenced that community. The community was much smaller back then. But, you know, those people uh, like Terry Cross, I don't know if you recognize that name, but he's one of the ones that really helped me out when I first started and he was almost unbeatable back in the day. I mean, he'd shoot a hundred matches, it seems, and win them all. And mm -hmm. like you, if, if you showed up and you saw his name, people would think like, I just might as well go home. But, you know, uh, you know, that, that guy shared so much knowledge with me and, and really showed me what to not do more so than what to do, you know, cause you could get, you get wrapped up around the axle really fast in these sports. And a lot of times it comes down to a pretty simple, you know, answer or solution that you don't need to overthink. And that's my problem is I'm an overthinker. <laughs> I think a lot of us suffer from that, especially when, when, when you don't know, cause you're trying to get the best, right. You're trying to get the best. You're trying to find the fastest way there, right. With the best equipment. And man, I remember just staring at ballistic tables for hours and hours trying to pick the best cartridge or the best bullet, you know? Yeah. So, um, your first match, let's go back right quick. How did you find it? And how did you decide that, you know, I'm going to shoot this because that's where a lot of shooters kind of tend to get stuck shooting their first match. Uh, I was working out of town and I went by this gun store just, nothing fancy and they uh i was looking for a range and they said there's a range up down the road so i went there and i just assume i can go shoot well that morning it's a match mm. and uh i was with a buddy of mine and he really didn't want to go shoot the match he just wanted to shoot because mm. you know you might get embarrassed if you're at a match where you really don't get embarrassed if you're shooting i was like man i'll jump in you know uh I, so i just jumped in and said, I'll see what I got. And people at the same, it's the same today as it was then. A lot of people were willing to help me. Uh, and, you know, but they helped me get started. And then it's like, once you're started, it's like, you're on your own, dude. That's why I hit the first <laughs> target because they kind of walked me into that one. And then after that's like, okay, he's good now. And uh, far from it. But uh, so I just stumbled upon it and happened to, to shoot the match instead of wait and come back on a range day. So I can just jump in head first. Isn't that to me like that to me, that's the breaking point. That's once you sh finally decide to shoot the match and once you shoot it, it seems like from there on, it's just, just straight up. Yes. You know what I mean? And, and a lot of people just get paralyzed by, well, I'm not ready to shoot my match. And I'm, and I'm like, you're not going to be there to win. You're going to be there to learn. Yeah, exactly. I tell people this sounds bad, but no one cares where you finish. They, uh, when you shoot a match, there's two places that they look at. Where did you finish? Meaning like yourself, when you look at the scores and who won it. And, you know, I could ask most anybody say in the PRS who won five matches ago. And they probably, they couldn't even, they'd have to look it up. They don't even know. They probably know where they finished, but they don't know where the other 200 people in the match finish. So we kind of get full of ourselves and thinking that someone's going to see that I finished low and it deters them from wanting to shoot. But I'm, it's really not like that. Uh, you know, so that's why I tell people just jump in because, you know, people will help you and no one's going to criticize you for not doing good, you know, right. especially if you're new. Right. Uh, and, and those that, that have been in it for a while, they understand that you can win everything, right? You're going to have some exactly. really bad matches and, and, and they don't even, 
Like, oh, so and so, they might notice. Oh man, did you see where Robert ended up? Yeah, man, he he had a bad match. But they don't say he sucks. He just they go he had a bad match because that's the nature of the game. Yeah, I wonder what happened. It's, this is a sport and a really good uh, shooter that uh, shoots in other disciplines, pistols and three gun and stuff like that. He told me one thing I don't like about uh, say PRS is it's a game that where you can do everything perfect and still not win. And I know that people will pick that apart saying, but you know, you might get the long range stage at a certain time. Someone else gets a better condition than you or something. So, you know, even though you did everything right, you may not win the match. And that's how I've really looked at it is me versus a course of fire, not me versus these 200 people out there. So I'm going to do the best I can do per uh, the conditions and situation. Someone else is better might beat me, but you know, I'm going to do the best I can do. And if I keep playing it enough, the odds are I'll, you know, keep rising. Uh, so that, that's really how I look at it instead of, Oh, I probably won't do a good at that match. I won't go. Yeah. You know, I'm going to, I throw myself out into any situation, good or bad, because the matches I do the worst in are the ones I learn the most in. And if I keep doing that, I'm going to elevate myself as a shooter that, you know, I'll become a more well-rounded shooter overall if I keep putting myself out there. But if I cherry pick my matches and stuff, then, you know, I'm only doomed to live in kind of like an echo chamber or something, you know, and like, this is all I know. This is, you know, I'm not exposed to things outside of that realm. So that's, that's kind of why, and that's why I want to shoot multiple disciplines too. You know, uh, you learn stuff and, and we're all here to learn. You can either lose or learn. That's what I was told a long time ago. So if you lose and you go back sullen, like, oh, I didn't do good. You know, I, I got the wrong squad. I started out on the long range at, at midday or whatever you're losing. But if, if you saw like, man, I was trending low in all that mirage, you know, uh, next time I shoot that match, if I'm in that same situation, I'm, I'm going to guess that, you know, it shifts my image or something. I'm going to favor a little high or whatever it may be. You know, now you're learning and you're probably in a better position to do better the next time. So either lose or learn. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's true. The, uh, the other thing about it is have you ever not wanting to go to a match and then you end up just dragging yourself there and then you end up doing really good. Yes. <laughs> my, my first win ever in PRS. Uh, I did not think I was going to do good because it was a course way outside of what I was used to. And I dropped like 15 points. And I was like, man, I was packing up uh, my gear in my car. <laughs> and the match director, he was running. He's like, you, you got you to gotta come up there. Uh, you might have done good. I was like, all right. I went up there and I won by nine points or something. <laughs> And I was like, what? <laughs> it's crazy. So, it's crazy how that happens. Uh, my wife is the one that pointed that out to me. Uh, she's like, I, she's like, how'd you do? And I'm like, I won. And she's like, oh, that's good. You know, congratulations, whatever. She's happy for me. And then, you know, whatever. Go shoot another match some other, you know, time down the road. And, and you know, I come back home. How'd you do? Oh, man, I won. Oh, great. And it, it was like two years, three years later that she told me, she goes, have you realized that every time it seems like whenever you don't want to go, you win or you do really, really good. And I'm like, I had not thought about that. And then I decided to think about it. And I think it's because there was no pressure, right? You don't yes. have the pressure of winning. You're like, well, uh, whatever, I'm just going to go. And then you just shoot. You just shoot. And, yep. you, you know, you, you don't, you just kind of just shoot and that's when i don't know that's when i do well yeah you put a expectation or a, in anything like that on yourself uh that's another hurdle you have to overcome during the match and you've already dealing with win you're dealing with competition you're dealing with all these other things so to me it's like how do i knock off these hurdles and expectation can be one of the biggest of hurdles you know because if you're focused on that during the match then you're probably not focused on breaking good shots or watching the mirage or whatever else it may be, you know, so like just get that out of your head, you know, and, and just move on and just forward, focus forward. Or, you know, you, you have, I don't know, let's just say you have a bad stage. You drop three, four points and you're like, Oh, I just ruined my chances. You know what I mean? You start thinking about that and it's ah, yep. just, just shoot. And I saw uh, one of my first PRS, PRS matches that I went to, 
I saw what's his name. He he was shooting a six br. I remember, and I was amazed that he was shooting a six br. Uh, God, I can't think of his name. But anyway, very first stage, we squatted together. For very first stage, he gets a zero, and I'm like, well, that dude's done. You know, I remember thinking yeah. that. God dang, I wish I could think of his name. Um, uh, anyway, uh, it was down here at Rifles Only, and it was a two-day match. But anyway, long story short, after two days, he won. <laughs> and when I saw that, again, you know, this is one of my very first PRS, ma- PRS matches ever, and I was I was amazed that he won. And, I, I mean, I was happy for the guy, and I was happy for me because I'm like, holy crap, that just – reinforces you know I, I, that's another thing that i really liked about prs i'm like man you can tank an entire stage and still win that's yep. that's awesome there's some matches or you cannot do that at and say like k and m matches you know you cannot afford to have a mag failure or anything like that but i remember i shot the heat stroke one year and it was what i call like a skull dragger match like what you're talking about you could have an issue and fight your way back up to the top. And I remember on that match, I zeroed three stages wow. and I got, I think 11th place. Nowhere else can you zero three <laughs> stages and, and knock on the door of the top 10. And it hit me. I was like, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. So don't ever put it out in your head that you're done because that's the worst thing you're going to do to yourself is, is, you know, another level of expectation. I'm done. You know, uh, you, you did yourself no favors by by telling yourself that you say you know all right i learned from this i'm uh you know i didn't drop 10 the next you need to be thinking i have the opportunity to get 10 on the next stage you know so stop thinking of the negative look at the what you can get and and grab every point you can that's that's how i look at it yeah you know? and like you said if you're not just at least learn from it and yep. just evaluate and like okay that's this is what i did got it yep. what did i learn well don't do that or whatever and then just move on you know someone told me once you smell that sweet smell of burnt bargain or whatever it is you're shooting take the data <laughs> you got from it don't dwell you know if it was a miss and it went off the left don't dwell on it but say okay i need this much instead of what i thought i had and move on like take the data and move on don't take the sorrow with you just take the data take the knowledge and, yeah and feast uh lanny basham says feast or forget Either feast yeah. on on your hits or forget the misses and just That's it. move on. So so you know so you you start shooting PRS or tactical whatever they were called back then. At what point? I mean, you lived through the through the through the change, right? When it became PRS, how has that changed the sport? I've seen the PRS go through. I think three ownerships or whatever and it's been kind of the same the main thing i would say when i first got into it and i'm on a steep learning curve when it started uh like i said there was guys doing it long before i was but you know when i saw the prs come to be there was kyl stages and hostage uh stages uh big small uh you know where say you could shoot the big target for one point or the small one for two and you'd call it if you shot a hostage instead of the hostage taker you lot you got a zero same way with a kyl you know like you know your limits so that was one of the things how it was back in the day and more positional shooting you might show up to a stage and you might have to do the standing kneeling sitting with a sling or some paper uh it's definitely gotten rid of all of that and i do think to be super competitive the direction they're going they have to get rid of those things uh because they become what we call the cider stages you don't want to your match be decided by one stage. You know, you want to gruel it out and, and show uh, consistency. You want to win by consistency, not because you got lucky on one stage and another guy didn't, uh, you know, so that's been the one thing I'd say is a lot of those stages kind of got thrown out and it's just one point for one shot, uh, you know, and like in KYL, they would say, well, each shot, you know, used to, uh, the big target was worth, say, one. The little one, next one's worth two, three, four, five. And if you miss one, you got a, you got a zero. Mm-hmm. So if you hit all of them, you just got a lot of points. Right. And if you miss it, you got – so now a guy's got 15 points ahead of you on one stage. Yeah. You know, so it gets it gets wild. and uh, But even when they went down to one, 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 you know, all the way down, 
that technically that last shot, if you miss it, is worth four points because you give up the four accumulated points you already had. Uh, so, you know, that now it's just if you miss it, you miss it. And I do think that's a good direction uh, to go in. I still like the outlaw gamble matches, and I want to shoot a few of them every year just because I think it's fun. But for the overall series, I don't think that's the answer. Uh, but that'd be the main thing that I'd say is change. And then the uh, the addition to gear. Uh, like I remember when the bags started coming about, like before there was, there was a time in the pre-game changer and post-game changer, you know, or if you're <laughs> we bad, the uh, uh, fortune cookie, you know, right. these positional bags. Uh, it went to people use a sling and they would bind in with the sling on a prop. And the, the different theories are, well, I'll put my bipod on the back side of the prop and drive in, or I might put my bipod on the front side and use it to mitigate recoil. There's all these different techniques to do it. Well, nowadays you throw a bag on it, you balance a heavy gun on it with a light trigger and, and you, you shoot it. So it's free, like free recoil. That, that's very popular uh, these days. I'm not a proponent of it myself. I think it's a tool you need to have in your toolbox. Like, you know, there's a time and a place for it, but I personally don't do it, but I also shoot 308 and tack division. So that doesn't jive with free recoil. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, well, they're starting mat starting fires with the sticks and stuff still. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so what, what is your, uh, so you don't use the bag? No, I do use the bag. I'm saying I don't free recoil. Oh, you know? the free recoil. Yeah. There was a time where guys would take their cheek piece off, get off to the side and pinch their trigger guards. You know, <laughs> I was like, I don't play with any of that stuff, but I yeah. mean, and I, but I'm, I'm not knocking it because it takes, there would be no innovation if guys didn't try different things. Right. So like it, I'm glad people are willing and brave enough to try it uh, on the clock. I'm not, I'm going to stick with what I know. <laughs> the, uh, you know, in F class, a lot of people, a lot of shooters, they're free, uh, free recoil. I don't. But then when I went to PRS, I started experimenting with it because I, I, I saw somebody do it. So in that's me hanging on to the gun. I was all over the place, but once I let it go, I'm like, Oh good. I can just squeeze the trigger. And, uh, it was amazing to me that I was actually free recalling in PRS and not in F class, <laughs> you know, yeah, a little backwards. It was backwards. But, uh, after a while I, uh, I started hanging on to the rifle. I started practicing like that just cause you can, uh, I could see my impacts better holding onto the gun versus yes. free recoil, right? But I mean, yeah. don't don't get me wrong. I wasn't burning it down. I was just <laughs> things that I learned. <laughs> I've seen guys that are struggling. You introduce them to free recoil, and they all of a sudden you need to learn what stability looks like in a scope. I tell that people when I do little classes and stuff. I tell them like because you don't know what it's what stable is till you witness it for the first time, right? So free recoil is a way that they can at least learn what a, a, a clear sight picture, a steady sight picture looks like, and but they're not going to manage the recoil well. And you need both skills, but, you know, you can at least introduce them to that and, and build them up, you know. And then I've been on stages before where I have to free recoil. Like that might be the only way I can get steady. So you then you're trusting your wind call. And if you miss, you don't know, you probably don't know where you missed, but you know, you gotta, that's when you get into other things of confidence, say like, trust your dope. I either held too much wind or not enough wind. That's going to be my answer. So mm -hmm. which way did I probably <laughs> miss? And you know, uh, you know, you're knocking it down, but if you can spot your shot, you know, you missed upwind or downwind. And uh, you know, so it's a quicker answer granted that you can get the stability. Is, is my thoughts on it, you know, and I, I feel like you're more uh, consistent uh, shouldered in with a good natural point of aim. I, I still really believe in the fundamentals uh, of marksmanship and, you know, applying them correctly to, to, to get where I want to get, you know, but. Uh, Something that you told me that made all the sense in the world, but it, it wasn't until you said it that, that I started really, paying attention. You said, if the crosshairs are not on the target, don't pull the trigger. <laughs> that was the first thing that took me forever to get. Cause I was like, I'm all over it. I'm, I'm in it, but no, I'm not looking for this. I'm looking for this. Yeah. You know, and I used to pull the trigger like that, but if I pull it, say over yeah. here and my wind is this way, you know, I'm well, building the, air up. The target's here. And I'm like, uh, I'm going to, 
Okay. <laughs> and and like and then you said that to me. I don't know where, but you said it, and I remember. You said if if the target if the crosshair is not on the target, don't pull the trigger. And it's like, oh, okay. It's like, no, no. And I set up, and then it's like, oh, look at that. It hits right. But it Rebuild it just makes your it just makes so much sense. But anyway, that, it's it's a simple clock, thing. That clock gets in our head, and. We, we always think we're on the verge of timing out. So I can't tell you how many people we, I know you've seen it too. They're blazing through a stage and getting all their, their shots, but they're not getting all their hits. And then here comes another guy running slow and smooth and he get, he may time out. He may not, but he gets a, a much higher percentage of hits. And that's you, who you want to be, because I believe it's much easier to get the speed to come than it is to get bad habits to go away. Uh, so yeah. I believe in slow and steady and the speed will come. I took my wife to the gap grind, I think two years ago, or maybe th it's three years ago. And she hit 90% of all the shots she took or 95. It was high, but she wow. would only get like four shots off per stage. Yeah. Like <laughs> she would hit it. So yeah. I was like, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I was the, the very person you just described. I was going real fast. And then I'd said, well, what's the point? And then I started slowing down. And getting, I said, I'm going to get, and now my goal was get a hundred percent hits. Don't yep. worry about timing out. And there was many times where I just wouldn't time out. I would just go slow and make sure I got my hits. And then all of a sudden I got them all. And I'm like, oh, I didn't time out. It was, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. And in PRS, match directors can throw you a curveball, and they may put in a 12 round stage with 12 positions. And guys are like, oh, man, I'm going to have to really hustle to get all these shots off. Well, that's a trap the match director set. And so now you're jeopardizing your whole way of shooting in hopes that you get all your shots off. You know, maybe you need to take a step back, say, I'm going to get I'm going to shoot the way I'm usually shooting, only get 10 shots off, you know, and I'm fine with that. You know, so don't fall for a, a course of fire is challenges and time management is a is a challenge and a skill. So. Like, don't fall for it. You know, I mean, just do the best you can do. Develop a style, perfect it to the best of your abilities, and apply it. And applying it doesn't mean throwing out the window the second you see a stage that you think is a hustle drill. That don't mean you don't try to hustle or something, but don't throw out your, your style and, and process out the window just for this. I mean, I've, that's bit me a bunch of times in the past. So I said, no more of that. I'm going slow. I'm going to get my hits, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the best. And the chips will fall where they may. Is, is how I look at it, you know. What would you tell a, a new guy that wants to shoot PRS? Like I said, the main thing is they don't want to, they don't even want to go to the first match. But let's say they decide to go to the first match. What 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 kind of preparation would you say they need to do? Uh, it, to me, uh, it's, it all boils down to three things: accuracy, precision, and stability. Uh, two of those we can accuracy and precision we can get it pretty much dead on now you can get a good bullet that's accurate and a good barrel and scope you know things generally today work as long as you're not getting junk uh just uh today to these days i don't practice much so i prepare like i go and i just get my rifle that's shooting good i make sure it's zero i got a speed and i got a uh uh a ballistic solver that puts those two things together so i got a good gear I got uh, my numbers, and then it really comes down to me just uh, uh, being stable. Uh, so, like, you know, just try to apply a little bit of those things, make sure your stuff's in order, and then work on a few dry fired things just to get kind of stable. And then what you got to do is you got to throw yourself out there because you will get exposed to things right off the bat that will tell you what to work on uh, moving forward. And the piece of advice I give most people is, is don't be scared to lose. Like, I, I've lost way more matches than I've won, and I will continue to do that, and I'm fine with that. Uh, but I wouldn't be anywhere if I was never uh, ready to jump into the pool, you know, on day one. So throw yourself – get I, – I, people, I hear this all the time. Oh, man, most anything you got in your safe is good enough. Just show up with that. I don't agree with that. <laughs> I tell like, man, spend a little time and get get your – make sure your stuff's good enough. If not, borrow something. Uh, if your stuff is good enough, spend a little time, watch some videos, say, here's what I need to get good data. Because at the anybody in the top 20 of most any PRS match, they're missing mostly because they either shot 
at a wrong target or something, which is rare, but the most misses are they too much wind or not enough wind, meaning we can expect perfect data these days, almost perfect, on, on plate. We can get data on plate with very minimal work. So, uh, and everybody has a rifle that balances good and you can hold steady. Uh, so that's stability is usually not an issue. So it usually comes down to, you know, the wind. And that's to me, the only miss that is acceptable is when I either held too much wind or not enough wind because uh, it, it comes down to shoot at the right target, dial the right data and uh, break good shots. And so it's, it's very a basic uh, recipe for success. And it's, we overthink it much more than we, uh, then we apply. So, uh, you know, just, but you got to put yourself out there to say like, Oh, here's my strong points. Here's where I need to work on, work on your weaknesses and, and move forward. So you just got to jump in, find a mint. That's the main thing I say is find a mentor, somebody that can, they don't even have to be a great shooter, but someone that can share their experiences with you that has already been down that, uh, you know, that, that Avenue, the, of the bumpy road, and they'll say like, this didn't work for me, but I'm finding success with this, you know, and you get on that path, you know, you're not stuck out in the ditch, you know, uh, you know, you're on the smooth road and, and you can progress more, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not that hard, but the hardest thing is putting yourself out there, I think, for most people, you know, so don't be scared to lose and don't be scared to show up. <laughs> yeah, I, again, I think once you show up, you're going to realize Oh man, this is fun, and I'm gonna. You're gonna do a lot more learning shooting a match than at home reading forums or whatever, yeah. you know. And those people on the forums are the people that's not out shooting the matches usually, so they're gonna be quick to tell you all the advice and stuff you don't need to listen to anyway. Uh, those you know that that do it are doing it. They're not talking about doing it. They're out there doing it. So if you want to do it, then go surround yourself with the people that's actually on the front lines, the boots on the ground, let's say, and you'll learn more from them than you will from that forum, just like you said. And it has to hurt to learn. So, uh, you know, you can think about zero on a stage, but until you go to a match and actually zero it or whatever, you're, it's not going to soak you, soak in the same way. You know, once you're exposed to that pain or that hardship, you learn a lot quicker. So put yourself out there. And you're not going to be the only one zeroing stages. No. That's the other thing. People think they have a spotlight on them. Like you're not, you're not going to be the only one you're on stage. And if you are, who the hell cares? You know? Exactly. Man, we shot the uh, finale a little while back and you're walking up to a stage and they're doing arbitration for the squad before you. And this is a 10 round stage. So we're expecting to hear, uh, Eric, you got a nine, uh, Jim, you got a, a nine, you know, all these high scores. And it was three, fours, three, fours, <laughs> fives. And they're like, man, the average score of the last stage uh, was a four. And you're like, oh, wow. So like you, but if you didn't hear that and you got a four, you're going to put yourself in the dumps automatically. And you're going to think like, I don't stand a chance, but you know, sometimes you need to have a perspective that this is a hard stage and and even the better guys are going to struggle or, you know, you just need to like, I did the best I can do. Here's where I learned. I'm going to move forward. Like I said, the chips will fall where they may just keep putting yourself out there and don't get caught up in the, the negativity. We want to, and it's human nature, I think, but you, it, the, I think you'll do better if you just look at opportunities to learn rather than opportunities to blame stuff. I know people that have never lost a match. They're, their uh, gear went down, their scope stopped tracking, their, their gun sped up nine feet per second, <laughs> their zero shifted a tent. You know, they, they have all these excuses. Uh, and when they win, they won. And when they didn't win, something went wrong. You know, uh, when I win, the gun, all my equipment worked exactly how I want. And whenever I don't do good, generally, it's this guy that costs me those points. So, you know, uh, well, don't hold yourself to a crazy high standard. <laughs> the, the best, the best, one of the best things that I have about a match that I shot was, uh, so I'm, you know how you shoot and you're with your squad and then sometimes you catch up to the next squad, right? Yeah. So that's, uh, that's, that's what happened to me, right? We're, we're catching up to the next squad and I shot first. And so I'm, I'm like, well, I'm going to move over to see how they're shooting it. 
so that I can watch. But anyway, as I'm walking to the next uh, stage, uh, from far away, you know, I'm still like 100 yards away, and I see this guy's about to go, and he's got a cigarette in his mouth, right? And he's ready, you know? And, you know, he's looking at his rifle and all, and then he goes, and he starts shooting. And it was, uh, it was like four or five different positions that he had to move. And this whole time, he's got his cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> and I'm watch- and I'm walking and I'm watching this guy shoot shoot move shoot move right and I'm thinking this guy's gonna be a badass like nothing f- I mean to to shoot the stage with a freaking cigarette in his mouth and he <laughs> had to move and everything and I was I mean I was amazed and I finally before he got done right as he got took his last shot I walk up to the point where I can actually hear what's going on and he's done shooting. He clears his gun, and the arrow goes, all right, good job. I got you for one. <laughs> <laughs> and I started laughing because my, my, my perception is like, this guy's cleaning, just cleaning everything. And this guy was so happy. Like, oh, thank you. You know, and I was like, man, that, that guy's having fun. Like, he shot. He hit one target. He was, I don't know. It, it was... It was one of those images that are burnt in, into my memory just because <laughs> my, my perception versus reality, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, I love seeing stuff like that, you know, and the people that really are there to have fun. I genuinely enjoy that. And I believe the sport has to have that because if it was only the top 20 people that kept showing up to the matches, it wouldn't be much of a sport. But I see people that, that are doing that, that are showing up match after match after match. And there's a lot of them. And I'm like, man, that is the heart and soul of this sport. And I'm, I'm grateful for them because they let us all have the fun we, we want to have, but well, I'm not going to partake in that. They, uh, they, well, theater. they let us realize that how fun the sport can be, right? Like we're the yes. ones that kind of take it too seriously sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And I used to be that guy uh, and beat myself up on stuff. And I'd started doing better and having much more fun when I would kind of detach from that. Uh, the, my first good podium finish. And I think you, uh, on a two-day match, you were there at it. Uh, I believe it was in Texas, uh, the Jurassic Classic. Uh, it was my first match where I went out with a lot of industry people that uh, that had never shot a match before. And they were like, hey, can you show them? They've never done any of this. Can you just show them? Well, I was looking at like, oh, I don't have any of the people I get win calls from. Uh, I don't have these, what are now I know are crutches, but I thought they were what I had – mandatory pieces for success guys that would show me how they're going to run the stage guys would give me win calls all these things and uh instead now i'm showing some other people kind of how to do it well unknowingly i'm detached from that and i'm just focused on them and i shot the best match i'd ever had at the time and when they called the names i was in second wow i'd never i don't think it broke the top 20 before and i'm all of a sudden (laughs) in second and and there's some heavy hitters out there and i'm like okay and it really, a light bulb went off. I was like, there's something to this, you know, where if I take it too serious and I compare myself to others without even knowing where the chips are at, I have no idea. All I know is, you know, and, and we're, as humans, look at worst case scenario a lot is, is I'm looking four stages back where this guy beat me by four points on this stage. I'm still mentally there and he's progressing and I'm still stuck there. So once I learned to kind of get back and just, and and focus on moving forward i started doing better and then i started getting top 10 finishes and top fives and stuff like that you know it it, i wasn't any better of a shooter you know i wasn't better at win call i wasn't better at stability any of that stuff i was better at detaching myself and my emotions from it and the negativity more than anything and moving forward so like that was a huge light bulb for me so what did you do going forward you go by home depot pick up eight or nine guys to put a squad together so you can yeah. <laughs> like, y'all shoot with me <laughs> i need eight or nine guys <laughs> but you got to cover your match <laughs> yeah, cause you found out that you do really good when people have never shot before on your squad yeah. <laughs> Well, so i tell you what I've done since then. Oh, that's so stupid. <laughs> I love that. I love everybody in the sport. There's very few people we don't like. So I don't ever look at a squad saying I don't want to be there. So what I've done since then is I never want to choose my squad. I want to squad where it falls. And, you know, I'm not against shooting with my buddies or anything like that. And I've got some people that I ride with that, that want to shoot with me. But I, it is a thing in my head. I don't want to 
choose where I shoot uh, or who I shoot with because I don't want it ever back in my head like worrying because I'm not with my my crutch. Right. Let's say you know. So I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna. I showed it this match. I'm gonna shoot. Here's this. I have to shoot in this stage. I have to shoot this order. I'm gonna do the best I can do. And like I said, it's me versus the course of fire versus me versus you, whoever. You know. Uh, and that's not for everybody. I know that. There's some people that want to know where their score is, where they stand at any given moment. That's just not me. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it, you got to find how your brain works. I think and and go that way. And that's how my brain works is just forward and not, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah. And I also don't ask win calls. I will share my win call with anybody, but I do not ask any win call from anybody in the match. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to know because I'm from Louisiana. I don't get the opportunity to shoot in heavy winds a lot. So that was, I'm just cr- giving myself a crutch. If I depend on your win calls every match and then the next match, you're not there. So I know I won't do as good as I could if you shared your win calls, but I also won't learn either. And I'm more focused on trying to learn no matter where I fall versus, you know, uh, you know, the best score. The score isn't what I'm after. I love a good score and I want to win. I'd be lying if I said I'm not, but I I want to be the best marksman I can be, the best shooter I can be. So to me, that's what I have to do. I'm going to give you a story about asking for win calls. Uh, Paul Reed, sorry, mate, but this is funny. <laughs> this is, but this is funny. Uh, so we're shooting in uh, Texas uh, at Triple C down there, survivor match or one of those matches. I, it was a two day match, <clears throat> and I'm squatted with, you know, at the time I don't know who who these people are, but Paul Reed and Chase Curtis from Curtis Sections, yeah, they, Chase, they were yeah. squatted with me, you know, where I was with them, but. So Chase had an MOA scope, okay? <laughs> uh, and I don't know if he still had it at the time, but he, so he, he, it was really windy, and we're shooting at that pavilion where, and it was, it had rained, and it's all underwater. But Chase goes over there, and he's shooting a KYL at like 900, 1,000 yards or something that we have to shoot. And everybody's having a rough time. It's one of those matches where four or five points, you're doing good, right? Yeah. And Chase shoots his first shot, right? And he he's aiming, I don't know where he was aiming. The point is he hit a plate way down. Like everybody was missing their first shot. Well, Chase shoots, but he hits another plate on the rack. And everybody, <laughs> everybody starts laughing like, yeah, impact, right? Like... There wasn't an impact, but everybody just kind of, because he hit yeah. something, right? It wasn't yeah. the plate that he was supposed to hit. Uh, so anyway, he shoots the stage, and it's over. But when he's done, he's walking off, and Paul Reed is next. And he goes, hey, where did you hold to hit that plate? And Chase told oh. him. So you see where this is going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul goes up there, and he shoots. And, you know, he has a bad stage, so he comes off the line, and he's upset. And he's upset at at Chase. And he goes, why did you tell me, you know, let's say one mil. Why the hell did you tell me to hold one mil? He goes, no, you asked me where I held. He goes, yeah, I was way off. And Chase goes, so was I. (laughs) Then why the hell would you give me that? He goes, well, I thought that's what you were asking. So I'm I'm kind of on the sidelines listening to this unfold, and and now it's funny, but, you know. (laughs) <laughs> I saw the whole thing unfold, but, oh, it was, it, it, you know, and Chase didn't mean to give him, like, they were, they were asked, Paul was asking for something different than yeah. what Chase thought, right? And yep. but he's like, where did you hold to hit that plate? And, of course, Paul wasn't, wasn't on spotting scope or anything. He just heard a hit. But anyway, yeah. it, it, it was a, so then Paul ended up having a really bad stage because of that. But oh man, yeah, you need to know what you think it is, and if you take data from somebody else, you don't throw out your uh, your advice, you know, and or you, your own uh, thoughts or opinion on what it's going to be. But you know, take it, and maybe combine it, or say, or or say like I thought half a meal. He said it's three quarters of a meal. So if I shoot and miss and don't see anything, maybe I'll go to his win call, or maybe you'll reverse that. Maybe you'll do something like that. But being spoon fed someone else's win call to expect it to work isn't always the answer, especially me shooting a 308. 
intact. I can't go up to somebody shooting a six or six five laser beam and expect the same wind call. You know, I I was man, I was so nervous when I started just shooting PRS because um, I was just doing it for fun. But people would come up to me and ask me like, "What were you holding?" And I'm like, "No, no, no. You don't want you don't want to tell. I, I don't want to tell you like." I'm afraid I'm going to hurt you. You know, whatever I say is just going to hurt you. So just, I'm sorry, but I can't tell you. And I, I just, I, I just worried that they would say, man, this guy's an a-hole. You know what I mean? <laughs> I see it the other way too, where you'll be ready to shoot. And then a guy shot in front of you, he goes, he gets a one or a two on the stage and he comes back. Oh man, you need half a meal. You're like, well, part of me says, do you know that now from your very last shot and you know, it's half a meal or, you that's what you held and you got a one or two because i don't want that like <laughs> so that's why i say to detach from that and like now if you're a new guy you're gonna have to take some wind calls from people and things like that but uh and people will help you but once you get established and you want to uh progress within yourself i think you really need to start depending on yourself more for wind calls but i can't tell you how many matches you sh it's like the tent shot bam I haven't even ejected my brass yet, and there's three guys over your shoulder. What'd you hold? What'd you aim with? It's like, my God, dude. Just, yeah, you know. it's interesting. And, you know, I come from, you know, from F-Class, where sharing wind calls is illegal. Like, Oh, really? Oh, yeah. In F-Class, it's it's you against the target in the wind, you know. it's. I like that. Like, you can't, like, you know, once, you, once you're done shooting, you know, if somebody says, what were you holding? Yeah, you can tell them. But if you're... Like if you're on the clock and somebody says, "Hey, I'm holding," what? It, no, no, nope. Yeah. No. DQ. Yeah. I, you know. There was someone in a ELR that would watch my turrets. He was behind me in a match, and he would watch it with binoculars. He's not looking at the target; he's looking at me. And I was like, oh, "I'm about to start holding wind," you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna dial this no more. <laughs> so speaking of ELR, how did you end up there? Uh, I worked for Manners Composite Stocks, uh, a, a stock company. And Mr. Tom Manners always went and shot that match. It was just, and he, Mr. Tom Manners is a big supporter of the shooting series in a whole, but he really gives a lot of funds and effort and resources to, to those guys because he came from the 50 cal bench rest world. And I didn't even know that was a thing, you know. <laughs> and uh, the one thing I haven't shot yet is 50 cal bench rest, but I don't think I will either. Uh, but he was real big into that 50 cal. Uh, the 50 Cal Shooters Association is who orchestrates King of Two Miles. So he's already in with this. He, we do King of Two. When I hire on, we do King of Two Mile every year. I was like, okay. So he asked me, you want to go shoot it? I was like, I just told you my thoughts on matches. I'm not scared to lose. Uh, so I jump in. I was like, yeah. He's like, well, we got an old gun. It's in the back. Go get it out. We'll clean it. Uh, well, I know it's a 416 Barrett. That's about all he knew. He didn't know the round count, hardly anything. And we get it out and I take it and uh, I missed one target. Like, but I applied everything I knew on that. So I just got thrown into that. And uh, it's not really anything I pursue, I would say. But, uh, you know, I, I enjoy doing it a few times a year. But you uh, so, won. Come on. Yeah I, yeah, I won it that year and I won it by a good margin. Uh and same thing, like, I didn't know I even stood a chance in that match. And so that was another. So that was the first opener. match you've been to? Yeah, I never shot an ELR match. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's too late now, but what you should have done is shot that match and never show up again. And be, and then you could just said, you know, yeah, I tried that, I won. Eh, it's not that It's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> Let me t I'll tell you another uh, funny story. Next year, no, to my knowledge, no podium finisher at King of Two Mile has ever made the podium again, much less a winner. Wow. Uh, very next year, I show up to it, and uh, we didn't look far out ahead and see that me and Mr. Tom Manners are going to be right on top of each other. We're two shooters apart, which really means one shooter because they leapfrog it. So that means I'm his spotter, he's shooting, and when it's he's done, we swap, and I go up there. Well, the very next year I go up there, I forget to I get my gun. I do everything, but I did not change the profile in my a ballistic solver mm. from him. And we were about five meals difference at the first target. Wow. So I shoot, bam, and I see it go low. And I was like, oh, I didn't dial. I look like, no, I dialed. What happened? And I'm all these things are going through my head. My scope lost zero, whatever it may be. 
And it, I bet you I went two or three minutes without taking a shot, just going through it. And then I look up at the top, I see TM416, meaning and Tom Manners. I'm like, oh, you big dummy. Uh, I changed it to mine, hit the rest of them, lost the match by one shot. Oh. Uh, so I would have got first two years in a row. Wow. I think. There was some other controversy come up from that match, but uh, yeah, I was right there at it. So like, it was doable for sure. So, uh, but but that's part of it, right? The mental, the mental. That is. That, you talk. You think I'm ever going to do that again? That burned. That that is a branding iron into my side. So like, that stuck with me. So now you put in uh, policies, protocols, whatever you want to call it, so that things don't happen. So now when I go to a match, there is only one ballistic thing in my solver now one profile That's into it. my kestrel everything else is deleted so you know it took something like that happening for me to want to do that you know used to i'd show up with 20 in my profile and i was fine with it that never happened and then when it does happen what can i do to not let that happen again <laughs> yeah dang you know, yeah that's gotta yeah. burn just a little but i was still honored to get second you know yeah. like that's still an accomplishment in itself so uh, I was I was I told myself I'm not going to beat myself up too hard. Uh, just take take it and, and learn and, and move on. But yeah, it, I'd be lying if I told you it didn't burn. <laughs> oh, I mean, I can imagine. It's uh, it's just one of those things. But like you said, you learn from it, right? Yep. Like now, so when it, people say, "How come you only have one profile?" You're like, "Oh, <laughs> 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 oh, you know, you might tell somebody go up to the line with only bro you know just one profile, and they might say, yep. "No, I'm, I'll be fine," and you know. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Good buddy of mine I shoot with a lot. He was having a bad match and it was out there at Triple C in Texas. And you know, uh, once you get past a certain part, the berms go away. Yeah. You're not in, uh, so if you're missing, you don't know where you're missing. Well, he started the match there moving away from the berm. So he's got eight stages before he hits a berm. So, and, and he did that. Now, if that would have happened on the first stage where he had a berm, he might have figured that out instantly and uh, fixed fixed it. But instead, he rode it to the bottom all the way through. And, and then when he <laughs> got to the stage, he never thought to check it. And uh, I told him, I was like, man, that's the first thing I would have checked. He was like, I, I never thought about that. I was like, well, it never hurt him. So, like, it, there was really maybe no reason for him to think about that because his dad is always up. He thought his gun lost zero or his right. – he thought he lost a lot of speed or – what have you, but man, if you're off a half a meal or more or something like that, that's big. So yeah. like that's something, something is wrong, you know, so <clears throat> you got to figure that out, but you need a little checklist of things pre-match during the match and after the match, I think to, to go over whether it's actual paper or if it's in your head. And that's one of us like, okay, I'm getting ready. Uh, maybe checking my zero. I'm deleting all the things from my, from my Kestrel, you know, and moving forward. I, uh, I remember when I first started PRS, people would ask me, like, you know, do you, uh, you know, people recognize me, right? Like, but I'm like, hey, th this is not PRS. This is not my sport. Like, I suck at it. Like, but, you know, they, they's like, oh, Eric's here. Let me ask him. And I'm like, bad mistake, right? <laughs> but they would ask me, uh, do you read the plate when you hit it? And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, which way it tilts. I'm like, dude, when I hit the plate, it's a surprise to me as it is to most people here. Like, don't don't ask me about reading plates. <laughs> yeah, I'm just happy that I hit it. It's sometimes yeah. that's just that's just the goal, right? And that's a uh, another skill in itself. And uh, I've watched somebody that learned to read plates, but their recoil management wasn't on point yet. So by the time they were on the target, every time they were reading it, recovering from the first mm. swing, so they were yeah. making corrections off Opposite. the side every time. And I was like, and I couldn't understand it till they told me what they were doing. And I'm like, oh, I think you're you're late to the because it happens fast. Yeah. So you got to be ready for it. And he, they couldn't believe it happens that fast. You know, so yeah, that's a whole other skill. That's sometimes yeah. I tell people if you get a hit, do it again. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to. I mean, I've seen guys, you know, and and I'm I'm I appreciate skill, right? And I think everybody does, but I would I would go to PRS matches and just bring my spotting scope and start watching and, and watch the shooters and watch the and man they they'd shoot and they'd be off center and then the very next target like KYLs right they're that center and they just stay there the whole way and you know and yep. I'm like God that's impressive that they can do that you know because yep. you know if I was hitting it's the same hold buddy 
It's the same hold. <laughs> so long well, the, until the, I miss, right? The KYLs are reasons like you got to tell people like sometimes don't say like, oh, it's left edge. Left edge on one, two, three, or four. Which one were you left edge on? Right. You know, and also look at a KYL. Some of them are on chains or straps and they'll twist. But like if you look at the JC Steel ones, I think they're on metal bars. So you could catch a right edge and it swings straight, straight back. So you need to look at that before you shoot it. Be like, okay, even if it goes straight back, that don't mean I hit center, you know, uh, you know, because I got burned by that. I was like, that was dead center. That went straight back and I was <laughs> the next one. So it's like, you dummy. You know, you got- yeah, it's, it's crazy. So, so on ELR, uh, that was just, the, uh, Hey, we've got nothing else to do. You, you want to go? Was that? Yeah, and that's really when I started learning that most of this stuff is about the same. It really right. is. But that's why I'm, I'm so obsessed with everything uh, in precision rifle is because, you know, like it, everybody that it, when I shot that match, it was mostly F class uh, type shooters mm-hmm. uh, and people like that. And they ran like very mechanical bipods and rear bags that was uh, the like the Edge Woods. I don't know a lot about this, you know, but like. Yeah, Edge Woods. Uh, the fixed type of bunny ear bags uh, where I saw it more as a troop line from PRS. It's because I've got transitions. I'm going up, I'm going down. I got multiple ranges. I'm dialing. So I felt like it was a little bit more up my alley than it was theirs. But uh, you know, so, but I did everything the same. I uh, got a zero, I got a speed and I got my BC and I put it together and I confirmed my data and trued it out. Once I'm done there, then it comes down to wind calls and trigger pulls and taking knowledge from one plate and applying it to the next. So that's exactly what we did. We shot and we shot solids that first year and you don't see them impact the target. You don't see the spot appear at distance, uh, it, but you would see the plate would rock one direction. I'm like, oh, that was right edge. I don't know if I was high or low. I'll just trust my data and move left. And I just kept progressing out uh, as I went, uh, you know, in that, that's what uh, sealed the deal for that one uh, was, you know, just applying the same things that I do for PRS or, you know, bench rest, there's no dialing, but you right. know, it's taking the data you get and, and learning, you know, from it. Yeah. So, well, that's, um, it works. It works. So you've been to the white house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did you end up there? Oh, that was a, uh, I was at the PRS finale two years ago or three. I got on my phone still. I got an email come through. It was like the president and his wife formally invite you or president Trump and Miss Melania or whatever, uh, to the Christmas reception or something. I'm like, this is spam. This is some kind of, <laughs> this is it's fake, you know? And, uh, I didn't think anything of it. And then, uh, I'm prepared to go to the, to the banquet and all that. And then, uh, I've somehow become friends with Don Jr. and Eric Trump over the years. And uh, Don's like, man, I wanted you uh, I wanted to treat you to this. This is awesome. Appreciate uh, what you've done kind of deal. Super nice guy. Very humble, uh, genuine, and much more down to earth than so many people would expect him to be. Uh, and he just did that. And so I took him up on it. So I left wow. from the finale. Everyone's going to the banquet. I pack in my truck, drive it through a blizzard to go home and <laughs> get on a plane and, and drive up there and fly up there. So, uh, that was, that was kind of fun. Yeah. Was, yeah. I've, I've had interactions with both Eric and Don jr. They're as far as I can tell, they're just super awesome people. They are. Uh, I, I went first time on a little shooting trip that, that he did for a lot of his buddies. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, he just asked me to come along. I was like, man, if you want to come, come out there. Well, I drove, I had a baby due in a week and uh, I was like, I'm going. So I drove and I was talking to uh, Don on the way up there. He's like, you're no dude. Like you got a baby coming. He's like, but then he started making jokes about himself and it's like, I probably ain't one to give marriage advice or anything like that. So you do what you want to do. Uh, so I go up there and they're just ragging on me the whole time about that. But I had a blast and there's other big gun companies. I don't want to name them uh, public, you know, and they're, teaching like this is our way this is the way you do it or whatever and i just hung out with the guys and i showed them like i'm a dumb redneck from louisiana i can figure this out you can figure this out here's how i do it and they're like oh that's easy and i'm like that's what i tell people all the time this 
hitting targets at distance really isn't that hard if you do the few things right that you're supposed to. And uh, it's just created a friendship with them and uh, gone back. And I was going to go to their place this weekend. They invited me down to Florida, but uh, it's my mom's birthday, and I don't know if I'll be able to make it. So uh, I probably won't make it. But uh, yeah, they, they've been great guys, and uh, they are not dummies when it comes to long range shooting. I'll I'll tell you that right now. They they know guns. They know loading. They're they they know what's up when it comes to precision rifle and uh eric is really good at machinery and he can build them and don's good at uh sh hunting and shooting so like they both come to it uh from different backgrounds you know eric wants to know how good could i chamber a gun to shoot uh and don's like you know i want a gun so i can go kill a grizzly bear or something with it so yeah they come at it from different angles but it, it's really cool and yeah uh, yeah sure. that's yeah i, I was remember one day going through social media and, and like, is that Robert at the White House? <laughs> that was good stuff, man. That was I'll cool. tell you what, uh, I didn't know uh, Don had been messaging me on Instagram. And uh -huh. uh, this is before I got married. So uh, the wife knows all about this. I was chasing this one girl and she's like, man, uh, I finally meet her one day. She's like, I've been messaging on Instagram since I saw you back and uh, you never respond. It's like, I didn't even know you could message on Instagram. <laughs> and she's like, oh yes, yeah, right here. And she's like, Don Jr. messaged you a few times. And I'm like, what? And I was like, oh, I spam that. That can't be real. <laughs> and uh, and then one day he calls me and I it says New York and I answer, and I could tell as his voice, like, oh, this is real. So like <laughs> yeah, uh my ignorance has bit me several times. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Oh man. So yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, they're they're cool people. Um uh, from what I you know, the interactions that I've had with them, they're exactly as you describe them. Uh, speaking of things that you do that, that are kind of crazy, the kittens, tell me the oh, kitten God. story. <laughs> that was nuts, dude. Like for that, people that have never seen the kitten story, t tell us the kitten story. I live in rural Louisiana and this range where I go to is a mile from my house. And a lot of people need to know this cause I get accused of animal cruelty separating them from their mama and all this stuff so that's like the big backlash i've gotten from the whole kitten deal but anyway we got a little we live on a farm and there's a, a shed out back and we started seeing this feral cat showing up and my little boy he's two years old mm -hmm. and he'll stand at the back door kitty cat kitty cat he wanted a kitty cat i was like you don't want that kitty cat that thing will <laughs> tear you up and uh so I, I always thought about that well one day i'm driving and I'm leaving work and I'm going to the range, which is right by my house. And I usually hit the range on the way to work, work, and then hit on the way back. And, you know, I try to get my practice in and stuff like that. If I'm in, in the mood and got time, well, in, I'm driving down and it's this back road and I'm doing 50 miles an hour. And I, something in my head said, there's a baby kitten on the side of the road. Just, I didn't really remember seeing it, but it's just like, was that a kitten? So I look in the rearview mirror and I see a little spot on the side of the road. So I back up and I'm in my wife's grandma's uh, uh, grocery getter. My truck's in the shop. So she lets me borrow her little Honda mini SUV deal. Uh -huh. And I got all my shooting gear in the back. And, uh, <laughs> and I just pull up and sure enough, it is a little baby kitten on the side of the road. He comes up to me all sweet. Well, I, I get the camera out and I'm recording this for my boy. So I tell people this video is never meant for the world. This was meant for my two year old son. And uh, so I send it, uh, I, I take it and I'm showing him this little kitten. I pick him up and all of a sudden I see something pop out of the woods and 12 more of them just ambush me. <laughs> they run at me and just take over. And they're obviously, uh, they were tamed or from a house. Uh -huh. I didn't know this at the time, who they were from, what's whatever. But I figured it had to be a family member because whoever dropped them off was close to me right because uh, there's not many people live where i live uh so man i send it to mike at Alta shooting solutions for some reason i don't know we talked about it. he's he told me he's like share that that will go viral and i'm like that ain't gonna that ain't nothing that's that happens all the time around here is animals get mistreated and stuff like that well i shared it and it blew up my phone was like ding 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 ding, ding, ding. <laughs> and uh you know you can scroll down and refresh your phone right. and it would go 10 shares, 20, 40, 80, 160, 240. It just kept snowballing. I was like, Oh my gosh, as fast as I could do it, it was going 
going on. And uh, then I started getting calls from the Daily Show, or, or you know, maybe not Daily Show, <laughs> but uh, all the USA Today, all these things. I'm like, oh my gosh. Well, they all want to do these interviews. And to me, what's funny is they're like, well, all right, I'll do it. Like, tell us about the kittens. How'd you find it? I'd explain it. It's the same story over and over. What do you do for a living? And I'd say, well, I uh, work in the firearms industry. And they're like, all right, sir. And like, they were done with it. Most of these places, they didn't want anything to do with the guns. Oh, well, yeah, that, that's, that's what makes it kind of, it's such a sweet story, right? Until, until it's like, oh, I was on the way to the, on the way back from the shooting ranch because I work, you know, for manor stocks, which, uh, you know, for rifles and, you know, I'm a king of two. Did you tell him you were a king of two mile? Did that change their mind? <laughs> you didn't get I there. Never told him nothing. <laughs> you didn't uh, get that far. Uh, the bad stuff is some people threw it out instantly. And I got, uh, the good side is I got message. I got thousands of messages and I still haven't opened a lot of them, but it was people saying, I had no idea that gun owners could be compassionate. That was some wow. people thought that some one lady in an interview said, I can't believe you didn't just pull over and shoot them all. And I'm like, lady, I said, I shoot all the time as much as probably anyone else in this country. I said, I don't know anybody in my whole circle that would have done that. Not one person. So you think that we're all like that. I said, I couldn't find one that would, that would just go do that. So, uh, it was kind of good to bring a good light, uh, on, on to the people that thought negatively and, uh, and talking about Eric, uh, he called me one day and he was out of breath. He was like, man, I was working out in uh, my gym in New York. And uh, I heard your voice. And he's like, people up here don't sound like you. And, uh, <laughs> people, <laughs> he said, yeah. and he said, I got up off the bench. And I looked in your own USA Today. He's like, it's good stuff, bro. Keep at it. And, he's, uh, <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it has some good things. It has some bad things from it, too. I got accused of uh, once people started following me. Here's what really is funny. My wife, if you go on Instagram, you can see your insights. My following before that incident was 99.7 percent men and they were 25 to 45 now it's 97 percent women from uh i gained like a hundred thousand followers overnight or something like that uh and uh my wife's like all these women following you now and they send you messages uh it, it was uh, look at it oh yeah that's crazy because uh, that is great. How many followers did you have before and after? I think I had somewhere around six or 7,000. And now I think I'm like at 150. Wow. So, 150,000. You gained like 145,000 followers. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, what's funny now is if I'll go to post something that is what I like shooting, whatever, you know, it's like 400 likes. And I, and I did a test because I was like, okay, I can post a polished, high-quality picture or video about shooting, and it does okay. I can post a random, shaky cell phone video about a kitten and just hold up a cat and say, here's a cat, and it'll be like 50,000 likes. It's like, <laughs> they only it's want me crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, man, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, because a lot of them, they, they don't realize what they signed up for in, in a sense of like, you know yeah. what you actually do, right? Yeah. And then like, like, hey, why I am I getting all this spam? Why am I getting all this gun stuff on my on my Instagram feed all of a sudden? Oh, it's the cat guy. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I'll post something they're like more cat stuff, please. And like, <laughs> like you're gonna give your audience what is. they want, man. Yeah, that is I've really crazy. laid off of posting a lot on social media because of a lot of that. Uh, you know, because oh, it's, you got to do your thing, man. Just got to do your thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I plan on getting back to it, but uh, like, it, man, I got some pretty hateful stuff too. Uh, once we find people find out that we were Republicans and, and like Trump and stuff like that, much, not even knowing that we knew them or anything like that, they uh, like they started making hateful comments and stuff. I was like, I'm not putting my family and wife into into all that, so I delete a lot of stuff. And uh, yeah, you know, it's, it, it's 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 sad, really, right? It's like it they, is. they can take it. They can take, and I don't, I'm not choosing sides. I'm just saying they as in general, because they can take anything and just make a mess out of it. Right. Like, I know it. Why don't they see it for what it is? Right. Just look yeah. at it for what it is. A guy coming from the shooting range <laughs> that saved some kitties, yeah. but they, they focus on the shooting range. 
Yeah. Right. And they forget the kitties. Right. Yeah. It's it's so dumb. Well, everyone's like, you separated from their mama. You uh, you should be ashamed of yourself. I hope you get X disease or whatever. I was like, golly, you were loving and talking. I hope you zero ago. your next stage. Yeah. <laughs> if they if they really knew where to hit you, that's what they would say. That's right. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, but I, I more way more good has come of it than than bad. But what another thing is funny is people kept. I get messages daily. It's like, what part of Bangladesh are you in? I'm like, what? Like the, the video <laughs> airs over where they're at. And they're like, you're not in Ethiopia. Or... <laughs> Just say yes. Yes, I am. Just look up Google Maps. People want to adopt them from around the world. Can you send it to Pakistan? Or... <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I, I remember seeing that. Story. That thing just blew up, man. It just blew up. Uh, yeah. It's, you just never know, right? Social media, that's the thing about social media, right? Kind of like we discussed at the beginning of this interview where people can use social media to get their info, get get the gear. That they can do some research and find out exactly what rifle to build, and they'll be most of the way there. But then again, there's that other, that other side of social media, like with the kitties, right, and, and how there's so many people out there that could just, they just, they're professional haters is what they are. Exactly. You know? You got to steer clear from them, and you know uh, you probably won't learn a lot from those people that, that, like the haters on the forums that give you advice. You know you can't do this or whatever. Like you need to steer clear from most of the people and just focus on the positivity and positives and move forward. You know, uh, one step at a time. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I I don't let them phase me or anything like that. But well, you uh, they are there. You can't, you can't, because they will. They'll try, and that's I think that's what they get out of it but whatever let's let's not talk about them anymore because that's what they're looking for <laughs> they don't deserve the credit <laughs> they don't deserve the credit let the haters hate so man i appreciate this interview this or you know I, i'm that's not even an interview it's just a chat which this is how i like to do things uh, but, well i appreciate the opportunity i don't feel like i can bring much to your viewers but you know. oh dude this is this has been in, interesting uh, you know it look it, <laughs> it's i'm a little selfish i just looking for for it to be interesting to me and you know you and i we saw each other at the at the expo we've talked before we've spent hours on the phone before hell we don't like, just like now it's, it's been an hour and 20 minutes doesn't even feel like it you know what i mean and it's <laughs> just here. just having a conversation but uh yeah man i think you bring a lot to the table in in a sense of you know just common sense knowledge that to me oh. like i said when you told me that one day just don't pull the trigger if the crosshairs are not on the target. <laughs> right? But it's such yeah. a simple thing that we forget about sometimes. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you know, we uh we do more we we need to stay out of our own way. You know, we're usually the cause of most of the issues we have and the the gear can almost always outperform us. So it's like my thoughts on shooting is find a way to dumb it down to where it's so simple that it comes down to I dialed the right number, I held, I aimed at the right target, and I held it still enough to break a shot. Like it, it comes down to that. So I don't, I'm not working with a lot of CPU up here. So <laughs> if I can do it, anybody can do it. And you just got to find a way to uh, not get wrapped up around the axle and just focus on the easy stuff and, and you'll get it. You'll hit way more than you miss just doing the simple stuff. Oh, yeah. Then, then chasing the, uh, the crazy reloading techniques or all the gear. Hey, That's hey, the other hey, thing I see slow down, of. slow down, slow down now on the reloading. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not talking about you, but like guys that like, I'm I didn't shoot I'm good. I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't shoot good this match. It must've been the bullet. I'm going to change everything for the next match. I'm going to change everything for the next match. Like stick to what you know and just keep doing it. You'll progress way further, but yeah, uh, you're right. Yeah. It's like, I saw your video about the uh, bump size and tooth uh, shoulder back to 2000s every time like but a lot of other people think you got a next out there's all these things but a lot of the winning is people when you did that interview walking through the pits they had just a simple approach i bumped my shoulders back 2000s it works like isn't that funny it worked for everybody down there that's tearing it up but the guys that don't uh shoot well are the ones giving the advice you need the next size you need to do this oh and, and there were so many people saying well Eric, Eric prepped all those people before he asked them. He just told everybody, and, you know, that this is this is how he, you know, pushes his agenda. And I'm like, what agenda? I'm, like, trying to help people. Like, what, <laughs> what, what am I going to – oh, 
you know, I'm going to convert all these people to shoulder bumpers, and all of a sudden, what? What do I get out of it? Nothing. Like you, know, you just, get a commission for yeah. shoulder bump. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I get a commission from the Shoulder Bump Association. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to help people, and, and but, you know, some people, again, back to those people that just, they're never happy. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, it, it's, it's just, it's awesome. I'm, I, I love helping people. I love, I love it when they take something that I provided and, and, and all of a sudden it changes their game. It gets them excited. And, and, and then all of a sudden, you know, it just, that spark is, is, is back. Right. And yeah. it just, it's something that they were having an issue with all of a sudden it's how many fixed. people in F class chase speed and like, that's going to solve my problem because if I go fast, I'll have less wind drift. Like, does that happen? Only the there's very got, few, very few, but there's they're not usually doing well. That okay, that's it. And I tell people that in PRS and NR, I do a lot love NRL Hunter too. And a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to get all the speed that way. If I'm off ten yards, I'll probably still catch a top or a bottom. That's the other thing I tell people is like, man, don't chase these extremes. Find something mild that works, and because you may lower your wind drift a little bit, but you may also which is way more helpful stay in the gun easier and uh, and see what's happening downrange, which will give you more uh, advice. And, and it seems like when you go to the extremes, you, uh, uh, you, you things become more finicky and uh, they change more. Like your, your average velocity may fluctuate more than it would as a mild load, things like that. So uh, I was just kind of curious on the, the F class. No, side no, we don't, we don't chase speed. It's uh if anything, like the 284s, they used to run them around 28, 20. That was kind of the speed that most guys would settle for. And then David Gosnell, he all of a sudden he starts winning everything, setting records and just setting national record after national record. And and we found out he was in the 2700 area, but yeah. his gun just freaking shot. So a lot of there was a big movement moving to the lower node move to the lower and there's a lot of you know a lot of 284s that are in the 2750 area yeah they're just freaking hammering you know when i had a 284 i was at 2770 because that's where it shot like really good you know so just leave it alone but yeah we we don't tend to chase speed too much in f class okay because we're looking I for sm small groups consistency and if that's where it does it well you just gotta if you gotta hold more just hold more right that's it. I do want to get back in F class. Uh, Value Rifles, which is a Houston area, I yeah, think. Yeah, uh -huh. That's one of the closest F class ranges for me. So I, it's a dude, significant drive. Dude, that's where I to shoot. Oh, is it? Dude, say when. I'll bring a backup rifle. I'd, I'd love to come I'll out. I'll bring you the shoot. ammo. I'll bring you everything you need. Just all you got to do is show up. You ain't got to twist. You, you know my history on the offers yeah. and all. Yeah. And <laughs> all you got to do is show up. Just tell me when and. And uh, I'll bring, uh, you know, I'll bring whatever. Derek, uh, you know Derek Webster? Oh, yeah. We made him the oh, same overalls. offer. Overalls, yeah. Made him the same <laughs> offer. He showed up. Nice. Yeah, yeah I'll do it. Yeah, huh? we'll do that for you because, I mean, it's it's uh, it's different. And I want to get your take on it after you shoot a match because it's different. It's it's a whole nother, just like just like ELR, right? It's, it's, it's a different focus i guess in a way you know yeah strategies are different and you right. know the little nuances are much i've shot a few f-class matches but i was not an f-class shooter i was in that area working and that was the only thing to shoot so i took my little 20 inch 65 creedmoor with factory hornady ammo and i would just go shoot matches and i still got some of the targets to remember by but you know like i didn't win or do anything yeah. but I, I had a lot of fun and i was same thing i got exposed to stuff that was completely off my radar and I was like, wow, these guys know something, uh, you know, and I learned from them. They didn't even know who I was. And I just soaked it up like a sponge and, and, you know, moved on. But yeah, I didn't, I would not be a competitive F class shooter. I don't think, but I would be a enthusiastic one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would be, you just never know. Honestly, you just never know. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, I enjoy the bench rest. There's a bench rest club one mile from my house where the kittens are at. Uh -huh. So, uh, uh, I go shoot that with them because I can either be at my house on Saturday morning and drinking coffee and hearing boom, 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 <laughs> or I can be over there shooting with them. Yeah. And uh, I go over there and I found this one old man. He's 
about 90 years old or so and good old guy, but he don't want to move his rifle from uh, the bench every time because it's tough. So I always get on the bench with him and I shoot this four uh, strings uh, for score. So I shoot two of them off the bipod and rear bag with his rifle on the bench <laughs> and I shoot off the side and I alternate bipod rear bag and then a game changer on the bench uh, and shoot uh, like that. So I know I'm not going to win because it's hard for me to compete with those 50 power optics with little dots. Yeah, yeah. My dot, my crosshair covers up the target. So, but I was like, you know what? I'll play with them. I'll learn from them. And, uh, and I shoot it that way. And it's been amazing how competitive I've been doing that, you know? Uh, yeah. That, that, that should help your game, right? Cause that shows you how consistent you can be. And it's a steel is nice, but paper is the answer like this is where that bullet went 100% for sure. So whenever I go down there, I look like, okay, I saw my Kestrel told me to hold 3.6 up. Wow. I'm a 10th low or something like that. I measure it like this about a 10th or I'm a 10th high. I get to track data. I get to track wind gaps, uh, brackets or whatever you want to call it. Some people call it, I think bookends in that mm -hmm. game, like, uh, uh, stuff like that. So, uh, like I get to learn things from it that I go back. It's like, okay. Uh, you know, and what's really surprised me is we got gongs that we do our ciders on and I can be dead on the dots. And when I go up to the uh, target, I'm about an inch or two low. Uh, so it's like, I don't know if it's lighting. Is the target of, farther behind or are they on the same plane? They're a yard. Wow. Uh, but I think it's mirage yeah. because we shoot a lot of mirage. Yeah. Well, uh, down in, down where you're at. <laughs> yeah. So then that's the other thing I learned is, is like, that's the real answer on mirage, you know, uh, you know, it's like this paper, it tells you. So, uh, and then it, it made me train differently for PRS. And as I tell people too, like, that's when I quit truing data, uh, off the targets, uh, because I'm truing in this, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but I'm truing in this, uh, condition that's happening that I don't, I'm not aware of that, you know, that's why I'm a 10th or two off. So I true it. Then I go to a range and I'm a 10th or two the other way. I'm like, huh, that doesn't make sense. So it taught me you need to learn where you're uh, truing from. And it also taught me like you may have different points of impact differences shooting different ways. So, you know, it brought up ways to train at a hundred uh, to test point of aim versus point of impact, uh, you know, in different positions. So, you know, that from bench rest, I learned loading and I learned I had uh, variables in it or errors that I wasn't sure where they came from. So it's like, how do I fix them? I don't want to accept them and I don't want to uh, uh, correct for them. I want to fix them. So it's like, okay, I'll come back, uh, see what causes them, uh, fix it. I learn I'm a better shooter now. And then, you know, I can move, move on. So, uh, man, I take, I take a lot from all the shooting sports. So yeah, I would definitely yeah. come take you up on that. Oh yeah. We'll set it up. Trust me. I'm not going to let you off the hook. You're going to, you're going to have fun. You're going to have, um, Right, Robert. Now you get to nominate somebody that you think I should talk to. Uh, any discipline? I don't care. Of? They don't even have to be shooters or whatever. Just, just anything. It doesn't matter. Uh, you know how you talk about that 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 echo chamber. This is what I. This is why I started doing this. I'm like, I want to talk to everybody because I'm gonna learn something. Like I talked to Frank Galley last week. Then he had me talk to Chris. Uh, what's his Chris Way? And, yeah. and then, uh, you know, then I talked to you and you know what I mean? I, I just, I am, I'm really enjoying this journey. So I don't uh, care who it is. Uh, I'll say he's, he's helped me out a lot way before I, uh, uh, got into it. If you can get Eric on it, get Eric, but, uh, I, I'm going to say, uh, George Gardner or, okay. or Terry Cross. Okay. I'll, I'll talk to those three. I'll, I'll promise Eric we won't talk politics unless he wants to. I'm not, dude. I don't. I'm not good at politics at all. <laughs> Me either. We can talk. We can talk barrel chambering, whatever he wants. But uh, I'll talk to uh, those three and uh, see if uh, I have George's uh, info and Eric's. But maybe it's shoot me Terry's info. Okay, I don't know if Terry's ever even done a podcast. I have no idea, but he is somebody that is is a legend in the game as far as i'm concerned and he he would he's so humble he's going to tell you he's not fit for this or anything like that but uh he i've learned a lot from him being that he's generally the same location as me and he taught me a lot but 
uh, once I met George, who owns GA, that guy's seen so many things as far as the industry turning trends. He did a lot of F class back in the day. Uh, PR, he was an owner of PRS years ago. So like he, he's seen a lot of stuff too. So I, I gravitate towards guys like that, that that's been there, done that. I learn from them and, uh, and move on. Not saying you can't learn from a lot of new guys cause you definitely can, but, uh, I'm a big legacy minded guy. And I, so I appreciate that. So they would be my recommendations. Will do, man. I appreciate it. And, uh, it's been great. Thanks well, for, thank uh, thanks really for the chat, it, man. All right, man. Thank you.